Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for everyone who made it out today. You know, there's a reputation of uh, drug users uh, being out-of-minded, uh, lazy folks. When you see people getting up on a Sunday morning uh, to uh, make their way all the way up this hill, it gives me great pleasure to see so many folks here. So thank you for taking the time and the effort. My name is Felipe Lucas, and I'm a master's candidate in the Studies and Policies and Practice program at the University of Victoria. I'm a graduate research fellow with the Center for Addictions Research at British Columbia. Uh, Victoria City Councilor, and I'm also founder of the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, a nonprofit medical cannabis research and distribution uh, organization located in Victoria, BC. <laughs> Additionally, I'm one of about 4,000 Canadians who are currently authorized by the federal government to use cannabis for medical purposes. But enough about me. Um, today, my presentation is going to examine how the VICs and university based researchers have teamed together to explore the therapeutic potential of med medical cannabis and to improve safe access for patients. And I'd like to begin with a brief history of community-based medical cannabis access in North America. But the uh, late 1980s and late 1990s were the uh, peak of the HIV AIDS crisis in America, and there seemed to be little that can be done to keep an entire generation of young men from withering away as a result of what would become known as AIDS wasting syndrome. In response to this rapidly expanding epidemic, compassionate community activists in San Francisco established underground medical cannabis dispensaries offering a safe source of cannabis to those needing it for medical purposes. The success of these dispensaries was one of the factors that led to the passage of a state ballot initiative called Proposition 215 in 1996, making California the first U.S. state to allow for the legal medical use and distribution of cannabis. Since then, over a thousand medical cannabis dispensaries have opened up in California, and it's estimated they currently supply over 500,000 state authorized patients. There are currently about 10 well established dispensaries in Canada providing over 15,000 Canadians with access to a safe supply of cannabis. Although Canadian Compassion Clubs remain unregulated and therefore vulnerable to police action, and, and that's not a theoretical risk, unfortunately, the work I've done in the Compassion Society has been charged with three counts of trafficking before uh, receiving an absolute discharge from a, from a compassionate judge who understood the work that we're doing and praised our ability to fill the gaps that Health Canada had left in the program. And, uh, and so our high courts have been quick to recognize the necessity of this public health service. As such, the Canadian federal government has never successfully prosecuted a legitimate dispensary, and these organizations remain the primary source of medical cannabis in Canada. Vancouver's British Columbia Compassion Club Society, the oldest and largest of these organizations, was incorporated as a nonprofit in 1997 and now serves over 5,000 members. After finding cannabis helpful in addressing the symptoms of, uh, of, my, of Hep C that I contracted to through blood transfusion when I was 12 years old, um, I gave up a career as a school teacher to open up the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, or VIX in October of 1999, and this organization, which celebrated its 10th anniversary on October 1st of this year, is currently helping about a thousand uh, cannabis patients throughout Canada. Over the last few years, we've incorporated um, much of our experience and understanding of cannabis therapeutics into an extensive research agenda, which is something that's unfortunately missing from our federal government's own medical cannabis program. Despite Health Canada's announcement uh, of a five-year, $7.5 million clinical cannabis research program in 2001, very few clinical studies have taken place in Canada. Over the last seven years, only three federal, federally funded clinical research protocols have been started, and one of them, the study of, on cannabis nausea and appetite in AIDS sufferers, was cancelled when Health Canada withdrew its financial support. To uh, the dismay of researchers and end users alike, in June of 2004, the Canadian Institute of Health Research suspended the entire clinical cannabis research program, citing they couldn't guarantee funding past 2005. The final nail in the coffin came in the, the fall of 2006 when the federal government announced it was not going to supply the $4 million needed to revive this research initiative, leaving university-based researchers and NGOs like the VIX the task of rediscovering the therapeutic uh, properties of this medicinal plant. In her definition of new social movements, social theorist Iris Marion Young suggests that populist and surging campaigns display one or more of the following three characteristics. One, challenging decision-making structures and the right of the powerful to exert their will. 
two, organizing autonomous services, and three, movements of cultural identity. I propose that community-based dispensaries uh, reflect all three of these characteristics, and to this list I would add an important fourth characteristic of many new social movements, including medical cannabis dispensaries. That's empowerment through knowledge creation and dissemination, and that's where you guys come in. At the VIX, our early studies were pragmatic investigations of phenomena noted in everyday interactions uh, with medical cannabis patients. We make a number of strains available to our members, and there was some speculation as to the different effects of the two major subspecies of cannabis, sativa and indica. We designed a strain symptom survey asking our members what symptoms they experienced and which strains they preferred, and the results of the survey suggest that those suffering from chronic pain as their primary symptom favor the use of indicas, while those suffering from nausea and uh, lack of appetite prefer sativas. This proved to be interesting and useful data for the VIX and its members, and we can now more confidently recommend specific strains to alleviate the symptoms of certain conditions. However, we soon realized that this kind of novel research would have little, little impact beyond, beyond the walls of the VIX unless we went through the more traditional academic peer review process expected by the biomedical community. So in 2003, we teamed with a doctor named Diana Silvestri from the University of California, San Francisco to develop a research protocol investigating, investigating the treatment success rate of people suffering from hepatitis C who had uh, used cannabis during interferon ribavirin treatment, which is the treatment that most people go through for hep C. Dr. Silvestri's previous research has shown significant increases in both the in-treatment response rates and sustained viral response six months after treatment of hep C patients who used cannabis when compared to those who didn't use any illicit substances. And you can see that here, um, the uh, cannabis using population is identified here as uh, the 71% on the left, that's at the end of treatment, and the sustained viral response is the 60% who use cannabis up there. The amazing thing is she also, uh, she was testing to see if people who use illicit drugs in general did as well. And it turns out people who are using heroin or cocaine or crystal meth actually had a very poor success rate, around 12 or 15 percent. But if she included the cannabis users in that drug using category, the drug users were betting, doing better than those who didn't use any drugs at all. And so she had to split out the cannabis for, uh, folks, and that's how she saw it. The cannabis folks were doing better than the people who weren't using anything at all. So, although the results of our joint study were inconclusive, it broke new ground by becoming the first peer-reviewed medical cannabis research to ever take place in a community-based dispensary. Our next study began with an email from, PhD student, uh, uh, from a PhD student at the University of Victoria named Rachel Westfall, who inquired about the possibility of setting up a clinical trial of cannabis <coughs> therapy for hyperemesis gravidarum. Uh, which is severe and nausea and vomiting resulting from pregnancy that can at times lead to the death or injury of the uh, fetus or the mother. I was sorry to inform Rachel that she'd be highly unlikely to get Health Canada's approval for a clinical trial that would involve giving cannabis to pregnant women. But, uh, yeah, that's the reality of the political world we live in. But suggested that a retroactive survey might be able to identify women who felt they benefited from the use of cannabis while pregnant. So we eventually partnered with Dr. Patty Jansen from the University of British Columbia and Rial Kapler, who at the time was with the BCCCS and is sitting right here today, on this research project. And in January 2006, the results of this study were published in the Journal of Com Complementary Therapies in Clinical Practice, becoming the first ever dispensary-based study to be published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Here's what we found. Of the 79 women who filled out our survey uh, who had experienced pregnancy, 40 had used cannabis to treat nausea and vomiting while pregnant, and 92% of these rated cannabis as effective or extremely effective at treating their morning sickness. The study concluded that these findings support the need for further investigations in the cannabis therapy for severe nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. For our next major uh, community university collaboration, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are there any studies on uh, the effect of cannabis on, 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 on infants in Europe? There, there is, and um, the studies are a bit mixed. We did an extensive literature review <coughs> as part of this study. It seems that cannabis, uh, there's some small scale studies that suggest some developmental issues at three and five years old, but not, not detectable at four years old or before or after that. Um, but most large-scale studies suggest uh, little or minimal impact on fetal development and on uh, uh, intellectual and social development of, of kids, uh, of mothers who used uh, cannabis in, in utero. Um, and there's some very large-scale Jamaican studies that have been used to attest to that as well. And in fact, in the Jamaican studies, the women who used cannabis and used cannabis... Uh,